Let us pray. Father, thank you for this amazing story, this historical account of how you came to us. Lord, many of us have heard this for many decades. The verses are very familiar. The carols we've memorized long ago. But we ask you tonight to send your Holy Spirit in our minds and hearts and souls. Speak to us new and afresh from your word. Speak to us in the deep longing places of who we are. Minister to us, we ask. Speak to us. Comfort us. And especially fill us with your joy. Now may my words be your words as we seek to learn and grow together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Christmas is a time for everyone. Even the organist. <laughs> no matter who you are. No matter where you've come from. No matter where you are going. No matter what you've done or what you haven't done. The coming of Jesus into the world means that you are loved with the greatest love that has ever been or will ever be. In our Advent series this year, we've been considering all of the people connected to the Christmas story that are often overlooked by most. People whose lives were touched by the coming of Jesus in one way or another. Now as we celebrate Jesus' birth tonight, we want to talk about one more person, really one more group of people secondarily, that are overlooked in the story. Now we know that Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem from Nazareth, in order to obey Roman law to register for the Roman census. But this was actually part of God's plan as well. Micah prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, and his prophecy was several hundred years before the event happened. So yes, there was no other place in the world Mary could be when Jesus was born than in Bethlehem. And God used that Roman census to get them there at the right time. <laughs> so Mary and Joseph were among the thousands of visitors to Bethlehem during this time as it was one of the registry centers in the nation of Israel. Since both Mary and Joseph were descendants of David, they had to go to his tribal territory to be counted. That's the way the law worked. Now we don't know how long they were in the region, but while they were there, it became time for her to give birth. That's where the problem came in. In order to have a safe, private, comfortable place to give birth, Joseph sought lodging for them in an inn. But the inns were full because of all the census visitors. Here again is how Luke describes the unfolding of those events as we talk tonight about the innkeeper. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. In order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. 
no room for them in the inn. Jesus' birth was humble and crude given the circumstances. And given that the Messiah was also to come to be the servant of all, offering his life for all of us later, perhaps a humble beginning was best. Yet if we stop for a minute and look at this part of the story, we see people who completely missed out on the miracle that happened that night. Think for a minute about the innkeeper. He's one of those people we talk about, even in some of our kids' plays, we have an innkeeper character, usually has his hands across his chest, and Mary and Joseph come up to him and he shakes his head no, and you know, then the play goes on, right? For all time, this man has, remem- has been remembered as the person who turned Jesus away. What a legacy to have. <laughs> Here was the most important person he would ever have staying in his inn. And he denied them, his family, a place to stay. Now, it could be argued, well, the place was already full, so he had no choice. But he could have given up his own lodging for a brief period of time. It would have been an honor to do so for the Messiah, wouldn't it? Would you be willing to let Mary come to your house and have a soft, comfortable place to give birth to the Savior of the world, even if it meant you were to go sleep on the couch or you know, out in the hay in the barn with the animals for one night? I think most of us would be willing to make that sacrifice, wouldn't we? And what about the other people staying in the inn? They also missed out on seeing the Messiah being born. How many of them might have been willing to give up their rooms if they knew who it was who needed a place to stay? Now, technically, they didn't turn Jesus away if they didn't know about Mary and Joseph's need. But think about how they might have felt about it later. Oh gosh, if only I had known, I'd have been more than happy to come and give them our room. Sadly, this man and these travelers at the inn missed out on one of the most incredible events in all of human history. But, God made sure the news did spread in a very different and special way. Luke goes on, verse 8. In the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Wow. Tell me, that night, which group would you rather be in? Some, you know, comfortable inn dweller in a room where it's warm and you have a soft bed, but you missed out on this amazing event? Or would you rather be one of those shepherds sitting outside around the campfire, suddenly surrounded by the armies of heaven, bringing you great news? 
News that you and your people have been longing for for thousands of years. I think I'd rather be with the shepherds, don't you? (laughs) Here's a group of lowly unknown shepherds. Nobody famous. Nobody who ever did anything else special that we know of. And yet, these men, and maybe some boys were with them, were considered valuable enough and precious enough to Almighty God that they were the very first ones that He sent His messenger army to tell the good news. Talk about feeling special. And as I've told you many times before, heavenly host here doesn't mean a bunch of angels in choir robes. Host is a military term. These were heavenly warriors probably decked out in full whatever kind of armor and weapons angels carried. They were serious and they were fierce and they were not to be messed with and all the powers of hell were driven away from that place that night so that Jesus could be born safely. And the shepherds were the first witnesses of those. Pretty amazing stuff. This is God's character. He made sure the humblest of folk were not overlooked in this most blessed event. In fact, the angels say, look, you guys don't even have to take our word for it. Go and see for yourself. Tells them where to go find him. He's the only baby you're going to find in a cattle trough anywhere in Bethlehem. That's what a manger is, a cattle trough. (laughs) A makeshift cradle. And how did the shepherds respond? Well, they responded in awe and in faithfulness to come and find Jesus for themselves. Look how Luke continues the story. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. There he is. The Messiah is really here. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. I mean, just think for a second. You're a bunch of shepherds trying to describe to other human beings what an army of angels looks like in the middle of a dark night out in the field. You know, I guarantee you they didn't say, well, there are a bunch of these fat little babies with tiny wings kind of flapping around. Everybody must have thought, Either these guys saw something pretty amazing, or boy, they must have been out there drinking all night long and hallucinated, which of course they weren't. So everybody was in awe who heard this. Of course the shepherds probably weren't quiet. They probably told people going into Bethlehem and leaving Bethlehem why they were there. We don't know, but that's possible. Mary takes all this in. Here is part of the story she would come to know that she couldn't have otherwise, how God was working beyond just in her life and Joseph's life to get the news out about her special son. And then Luke closes out this famous passage by saying, The shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. Their lives would never be the same. Their faith was rewarded by their visit. God invited them to check out His Word as being true. And they did. 
And they weren't disappointed. They had seen the newly born Messiah. And probably this group of shepherds were some of the first people on earth to believe in Jesus. I mean, beyond his immediate family, of course. Mary, too, had her faith strengthened by their account of the angelic visitation, the heavenly announcement given to the shepherds. Here was a group of complete strangers to them who confirmed for her what she had been told by Gabriel when he asked her to take on this role months before. And they also had a supernatural encounter. So it was a special night. The coming of the Messiah and the Savior of the world. But let's go back to our topic of those who missed out. What about the innkeeper and the guests at the inn? They missed seeing Jesus. Did they ever find him later? Did some of them eventually see Jesus as an adult and hear him preach and see him heal and do other miracles? Is it possible some of those people saw him die on a cross? Who knows? Did any of them ever come to faith in Christ to believe that he truly was the Savior, the Messiah? Again, we don't know. But you see, we're different than those people in the inn were. Because all of us have an opportunity to encounter Jesus every day in our lives. Because now that He has come, and He has lived, and He has died, and He has risen from the dead, and He has ascended back to heaven and sent His Holy Spirit to come and be with us, we can take the Lord with us in our lives everywhere we go and in everything we do. That's an advantage that none of them had. Now, we may not be visited by angels, but He's here all the same. Jesus is present with us tonight. The scripture says, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, I'm in your midst. I mean, let's face it, we're having a birthday party for Jesus here tonight. How silly would it be for him not to show up? Oh, Jesus, we're not sure we want you to come. No, of course we wouldn't do that. (laughs) We started our singing tonight by saying, come thou long expected Jesus. If that isn't an invitation, I don't know what is. See, the greatest thing we can ever do in our lives is to come for Jesus for forgiveness and salvation. Nothing else we could do or accomplish or attain or possess in this world compares to that one act of faith. If we turn him away, like the innkeeper did, or if we ignore him, like the people in the inn did, it will be the worst mistake of our lives. He offers us not only forgiveness and salvation, but also pure love, hope, and joy. Love that we can get from no one or anything else. Hope that goes beyond just living in this world, but into eternity. And joy that cleanses us from all regrets and sorrows and angers and bitterness and evil. That's all part of the package deal, folks. So if there's a lesson for us tonight, it's look, let's not turn Jesus away. He wants to love us with a love that will never end. And let's not ignore Jesus tonight either. We've heard the truth here. We've read it in the Scriptures. You've heard it now. We've sung it. None of us now can plead ignorance when we stand before God someday. I didn't know! 
I was in the inn that night. If only I had known Jesus was coming, I would have done something different. No, we can't say that. Jesus offers us this amazing gift. And it makes no sense to present, pretend it isn't there for us and pretend He isn't real and wanting to love us. None of us deserves this forgiveness. Yet it's offered freely. None of us has done anything too bad that we can't be forgiven. Jesus' love for us is greater than all of the sins in the world. He took all those sins and had them nailed to His body on the cross. His love for us was greater than all that evil combined. And none of us can pay for our own sins by our good deeds, good feelings, or good intentions. We are lost without Jesus. So what I'm saying is, let's be like the shepherds. Responding to the invitation to meet Jesus and rejoicing when we do. Let's also be like the angels. Telling others to believe and come meet Jesus for themselves. See, the message of Christmas, as I said when we started this, is no one need be overlooked. Everybody is welcome to come into the kingdom of God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever is the biggest word in the world. It's like Jesus when He's speaking to people says, He who has ears, let him hear. That means this message and this point is for you if you can hear what I'm telling you. You know, it was universal. And you know what? No one will ever be turned away from God's love who wants it. If you sincerely confess your sins and accept Jesus, come to Him, ask for His mercy, He's not going to say, get away from me, I don't want you. He's going to wrap His arms of love around you and say, welcome child, you're mine forever. So as we finish this series on the overlooked of Christmas, let's all do our part to make sure nobody is overlooked that we know. In our families, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers. They can choose for themselves whether they want to believe, but they at least need to know the story. They need to know the facts. And that's our job. Because God wants His family to be as big in heaven as possible. So let's do our part to add to it. Let's say glory to God in the highest. The Messiah has come. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this amazing story that we have made the central part of our lives. We know it's true, and you confirm that to us many different ways. Lord, it happened a long time ago, but we know that the message of hope has spread from that tiny little town in Bethlehem that night to all over this world through the eons of time. We thank You, Lord, that You're still building Your kingdom today, that You're still inviting the overlooked to come into Your kingdom tonight. And I pray, Lord, that if there's anybody here who has never done that, never come to You, that tonight will be the night that they forever have their sins forgiven and forever know that they will be part of Your kingdom in heaven with all the rest of those who believe. Father, we glorify You for this Christmas season. We glorify You for the joy that it brings and for the time of celebration we can have. Thank You, Lord Jesus, for giving us this hope. For it's in Your name we pray. Amen.